Cool. Awesome. Um, can go ahead and get started with module one. Um, again, this recording will be available. So um, officially, we're not started, but I want to make sure if we're short on time, we can get through all the material and we're not, um, we're not skipping anything. Um, I want to give you guys the best, um, the best possible education I can. And so that's why I'm here um, doing this. And um, if you guys are interested in, well, I, I should backtrack a little bit. Depending on how things go the next couple of days, um, there's going to be a big announcement on Friday. There's going to be some other stuff going on as to our schedule. Um, so if it ends up being to where we don't meet for another month or so, we may pick every Tuesday or every Thursday to just do a chapter or at least get something done so we're not falling drastically behind when we lose time. So just FYI, kind of in advance. So anyway, this is a pretty basic chapter, right? We're going to talk about a lot of things that we learned in the last class. Um, we're going to review a lot of things. Um, and of course, if any time you have any questions, put them in the chat box and um, I will get to them as I see them. Um, <clears throat> Um, so we're going to talk about initial switch configurations. We're going to talk about um, basic configuration on switch ports, um, remote access. So we configured SSH last semester. Um, I say semester, uh, the last class. Um, basic router configuration, which is very similar to basic switch configuration. And we're going to talk about directly connected networks um, and a little bit of troubleshooting and show commands there. So they have this slide. It's a little noisy for me. I like to break it down a little easier. Um, and I noticed they didn't explain quite um, what a lot of these terms they use are. So um, a couple of things, DRAM, dynamic RAM. Um, if you don't know what this is, it's very popular in computing, right? Our PCs have it, our laptops have it, um, our smartphones, they have it too. Um, all of our devices have DRAM. Couple things to, to know with though with that, um, our DRAM is going to load whatever application we are using currently, or whatever um, file we're using currently. So you open a spreadsheet, for example, that spreadsheet is going to go from your storage device, and it's going to go on into your RAM so that you can edit it quickly and efficiently. Now this means uh, when we want to save it again, we have to take it out of RAM, put it back on the hard drive. So that's what would happen when you save a file. Um, but keep in mind, if you don't save it, if you leave it in RAM, that RAM is what we call volatile. So that RAM is actually going to clear whenever it loses power, whether that's because we powered off the machine or we had a power surge or brownout, whatever reason, when the computer turns off, we lose everything in DRAM. And that's okay. It's just temporary. That's its only purpose is to be temporary. We have our ROM, which is read-only memory. This is going to be um, never changing, right? This is... Excuse me. This is from the factory. We've got our bootstrap, our post system, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, this is built in to the chipset um, or built into the uh, main board usually. It's a little chip on there. It says ROM um, and it's usually very small. It just has these basic programs we always need are not going to change the lifetime of our device. And, and these uh, DRAM and ROM are pretty universal with computing, um, whereas flash and NVRAM are a little more uh, particular to switching and routing and network devices, uh, but can be on other types of devices. So our flash is going to contain our iOS image. Um, it's just a file system. It's storage. Same thing with NVRAM. Um, NVRAM is also a file system storage. Um, it's going to have our config file on it. So um, when you go and you type copy run start, it's going to actually copy our running configuration into the NVRAM by default. So as we're powering on our switch, there's a boot process that we go through. First, we do the post. Um, and if you're not familiar with post, again, very similar to average computing, right? The computer turns on and the motherboard is going to run a post. It's going to say, hey, power on self-test is what post stands for. 
is my CPU there? Does it work? Is my RAM there? Does it work? Um, DRAM, RAM, same thing. It's just a, another way to refer to DRAM. So um, then we're going to take a portion of the flash that we need. We're going to turn that on. We're going to make sure everything um, at least comes on. Then we're going to do the bootloader software. So as soon as post completes, post says, hey, bootloader software, come on, it's your turn. The bootloader software is going to um, initialize everything. We're going to initialize our CPU. We're going to initialize our memory, figure out, okay, how much memory are we going to map and what we're all going to do with it. Um, then we are going to initialize the flash system. So we're going to be able to load the iOS into our RAM, which um, I forgot to mention, RAM is super, super fast. Um, usually our hard drives, even our flash memory, um, like a USB stick or um, solid state drive, they're relatively slow in comparison to RAM. RAM is super, super fast, and that's why we love it. That's why we load whatever is going on in RAM so we can do stuff really, really fast with it. So we're going to boot up that iOS, um, and that stands for Internet Working Operating System. That's Cisco iOS, not Apple iOS, just clarifying. Um, and then iOS is going to load our configuration file and so on and so forth. So if we want to boot to a particular version of iOS, we need to specify that. So if you have a, a flash file system that is larger than, uh, or large enough, I should say, to fit two different versions, um, a lot of times when we upgrade, if for some reason there's a problem with the newer version, we can, excuse me, oof, excuse me, um, we can go back to the older version without deleting it. That's super easy with this boot system command here. Um, now when, when we go to this step five, we load the default iOS system, it says. The default iOS system is specified here in the boot system command. So um, we're gonna put this command in, um, in our global config like we would any other regular command, boot system, and then we're gonna specify the file path for that. We can do other things other than Flash. Usually Flash is kind of the default. Um, usually we do that. Some places will actually put a TFTP server. So um, you could put a TFTP server and you could host that iOS image on the TFTP server. Granted, you have to rely on that TFTP server. It has to be up all the time or else your switch reboots and if it can't access that TFTP server, done. Like it won't boot up. Um, so you can do other ways, but usually Flash is kind of the go-to um, only people with like next level networks are going to do stuff like TFTP and stuff like that. Uh, but let's specify the full path. So if there's a folder, like in this example, they have this, um, this folder here in between the .bin file, which is a binary file and, um, the flash, there's a, a folder in there, specify the entire, entire path there. So a quick note about startup and, and config.txt. Um, so when we do our copy run start, we're actually creating a file that is startup config. It's saved in NVRAM. And this is what pretty much they told me when I went through the Cisco curriculum. Hey, copy run start, put the startup config in NVRAM. Now there also is a file called config.txt, which really is a link to the startup config in NVRAM. And if you know a lot about computers, um, you may be familiar with that. Anyway, you can verify this, and I did that earlier in Packet Tracer, so if I actually open Packet Tracer here, if you look in, so if I do DIR, so we're gonna see our flash here. You see there's a .bin file, right? That's our iOS. And if I do DIR and VRAM, we're gonna see there's nothing in our NVRAM. What happens if we do a copy run start? Startup config, good. Let's do the dir and VRAM. Now we see, hey, we have this file called startup config here in our NVRAM. And then if we do dir for DIR, we'll see our bin file is still here and we also have this config.txt, which is interesting. Uh, we not only created one file, we created two files. All this config.txt, 
um, is a link back to this startup config file or like lost it here. And um, what that is uh, going to do is when we go into password recovery mode, we can actually access that copied file in our flash. We don't have to mount MVRAM to modify that file if we need to go into some kind of um, recovery mode. So a couple of LEDs. Uh, again, if you have any questions, stop me, shoot a message in the chat and I will address them um, as soon as I see them. We have a couple LEDs. We have the system LED, which is, um, you know, is your system working? If it's green, usually if it's blinking green, it's booting up. Um, if it's red, usually they have a hardware issue. Um, redundant power supply LED. So if you have multiple power supplies on your switch, you may have this LED. And of course, it'll tell you that status. If it's red, it's bad. If it's green, it's good. Pretty self-explanatory, right? Um, some other things we have here, these status, duplex, speed, and PoE lights are different modes we have on our switch. So if you look at the bottom, um, I don't like the way they organize this slide, but um, if you look at the bottom, it says the mode button is used to move between different modes, status, duplex, speed, and PoE. So when we move through those different modes, the lights on our ports, which they don't show, the lights next to our physical um, interfaces on our switch are going to change, right? So if we change to PoE mode, we're going to see the lights in relation to the PoE status of those ports. Same thing with duplex, speed, etc. A lot of newer switches, they just have um, usually like a port status and a port speed LED. They don't usually have uh, duplex. We don't do a lot with duplex today. We usually just run everything full duplex. Um, and then PoE is usually just looked at from a CLI perspective. We don't usually look at it physically. So here's a big like matrix of everything, what it means, right? If we're on speed mode and it's blinking green, you match that up, that's a uh, gigabit per second right there, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can reference this if you need to. Uh, the slides are up on Medicad. So if for some reason our system crashes, we can connect with our handy dandy console cable, which um, we went over, I think two or three times how to do that in the last class, um, if you were in there. We can connect with our console cable, unplug the switch power cord, excuse me, reconnect the power cord, um, press and hold down the mode button, if we have a mode button. Some devices don't have a mode button, um, like routers. On the router, I think you hold down like pause break or something. Um, and that's that's in documentation. You can Google that and it's really easy to find. Um, router, uh, usually password recovery is, is what we're doing at this point. But you can do that until it turns from amber to solid green. And then um, we'll get the bootloader prompt. So we'll be able to actually do things in the bootloader. I don't think we're gonna get into the detail of that, but it is there. And you can get documentation from Cisco if you need to jump in there and do something. Oh, excuse me, man. Um, and usually it's not very common, right? We're only gonna get in the bootloader if something seriously happened, um, like we had a hard drive or a hardware failure, or um, we had some kind of password recovery situation. We didn't have the password for some reason. So remote management is super important. Uh, we do that on just about everything in the real industry. Um, usually you don't want to run around with the console cable plugging into each individual switch and like, ah, oh, plug into this switch, do my command. Okay, unplug it, go plug into this switch, do my command. We don't want to do that. So we want to sit at our desk uh, with our big greasy cheeseburger as network engineers and never leave our desk all day and just remote into everything. So uh, we need to do a couple of things to get that going. First of all, we need some kind of IP address, whether that's IPv4, IPv6, um, depends on your environment, depends on what you want to do. Um, you can do either one. Now on a switch, we're going to have what's called an SVI. So the SVI um, is going to be assigned a, uh, an IP address, whether that's IPv4 or IPv6. Um, and that depends on, okay, what switch do you have? Does it support IPv6 or not? Um, I'm sure at some point there'll be switches that don't support IPv4. Maybe that'll be after my lifetime, but we'll see. 
Um, so the SVI, by the way, is a virtual interface. It's not a physical interface on the Switch. Um, it lives on the back plane of the Switch, is how I like to think about it. So originally we're gonna connect a console cable to our Switch and we're gonna configure the management interface. So I'm just gonna really kind of quickly run through what that looks like here. And this is probably really small, so um, there we go. Nope, I don't know if those are working like this either. It's gonna be in here, isn't it? Yeah. Do, no, I don't see anything. Okay, well, we're gonna do our best here. So if we go into configuration mode, we're actually going to go with interface. Um, if we look at our options here, we have right, our ethernet interfaces, our fast ethernet interfaces, our gigabit ethernet interfaces. We also have VLAN and range. Um, so we're actually gonna use a VLAN interface, which is a virtual interface, and we'll do VLAN 99. Okay, so we'll set an IP address, 10 dot, oh, what's the network I set for here? 10.1.1.2.255.255.0 slash 24. Um, notice we didn't get any kind of anything back here. So if we show IP interface brief, we'll actually see we've got an IP address on VLAN 99, but it's actually down. Which is right. No shutdown. Ooh, see, that's a tricky one right here with the VLAN one. That's administratively down. So you would need no shutdown on that one. However, this is just down. So um, instead of no shutdown, uh, what we haven't learned about VLANs yet, but we have to have a VLAN um, or an interface in that VLAN to, um, to actually have it go up. So what I'm gonna do really quickly here is I'm gonna hop into this router enable and configure your terminal. And then we're gonna go into interface 201 and I'm going to no shut this on this side, which will bring that physical interface up, but we'll still see, we're still down here. And then I'll exit and go into interface 201 and I will say, no, oh, no. I will say interface VLAN 99, change my VLAN on the interface. And if we show interface brief, then we'll see. Well, well, well. Interface V199 took my command, but it doesn't, uh, doesn't want to be up. It might be spanning tree. Still says it's down. Of course, it, it always does things that. Uh, Have that on my interface. Oh, did I type the wrong command? Ah. Are you serious? I don't have any commands here. Have done something wrong. Um, let's backpedal. Um, so, <laughs> VLAN 99 uh, can't default the interface, but no IP address. So, let's just do interface VLAN 1. It's embarrassing when this happens in front of people. <laughs> and then we'll do no shut here and we'll pull that up and we'll see we show brief. it always messes up when it's in front of people but you know if you're by yourself just practicing it works great right so here we see up and up um, that interface is up we're not going to worry about that quite yet so we did that, 
course, they say it will not appear as up up until VLAN 99 is created and there is a device connected to a core associated with VLAN 99. Um, and it does mention if you want to use IPv6 on a 2960, particularly, you have to do this SEM prefer. It's not supported in Packet Tracer and um, it depends on your switch model if you need that command or not. So don't worry too much about that. Um, and I won't set up, I'm not going to set up uh, SSH. If uh, you don't remember how to set up SSH, I thought there was a code in here somewhere. Yeah, so um, I did mention to people. So it, it is on the final for uh, last semester, but um, it didn't work, so we cut it out. So everything is fine. Yeah, you remember. Um, I won't configure SSH. If you don't remember how to configure SSH, um, refer to the Excel spreadsheet that is in the files tab of Medicad, and that's going to have all those commands for you in there, which I actually can pull up. If you're not familiar with where that is, you can jump into files here, and you'll see CCNA router and switch commands. And we'll roll down to switch configuration here and then SSH configuration right here. And then you'll have all the commands you need to do that there. Um, and if you haven't been in my class before, this is kind of like the, um, the Bible for the class at least. Um, and you can take it out into the real world and it works too. Just FYI. So there's a lot of uh, holy texts, absolutely. Um, so there's a lot of information in there um, I know there's a lot of commands we're going to be learning. We're not going to remember all of them. Hopefully we remember the ones we use all the time, but um, some of these we're going to need to reference something. And I don't want to have you all spend an hour trying to find one command because you forgot it. Anyway, um, so here's kind of a, a similar config to what we did, um, except for they use VLAN 99 and it didn't work for me. So, uh, of course, look what I forgot, the copy run start, right? So let's make sure we do that. Just so it doesn't like die and get rid of all my wonderful config. That's one thing in the in the real world, you definitely want to make sure you don't forget that command because it could be like the difference between a job and no job anymore. So um, default gateways are super important. And this was also kind of hidden on the skills final from last semester. It wasn't said that you need to configure this default gateway, but that is what we need to get to another network. So if we go back to our little example here, we have a router. I'm gonna actually configure this egress 10.1.1.1. And I know what interfaces we have here because I set this up a minute ago. And by the way, I started with a clean config on all of these. I didn't put anything on the routers and switches before we started this, just to make sure you know, I didn't prep it with anything special. So I'll put an IP address here and then no shutdown. And you'll see the light comes up here. I'm not sure if all of y'all are familiar with Packet Tracer, so I want to make sure I'm not leaving you confused. And then we will go interface v one IP address 10.2.2.2. And then shut. Copy this stuff. Always make sure to do your copy run start. Okay, so now if I try to ping from this switch to the other switch, I won't be able to ping. And that's going to time out and take forever. All right, so just kind of um, if you if you lost, if I lost you um, at some point, I did configure the router, both interfaces, and I did configure both switch interfaces. So this should theoretically ping, right? And just for sake of doing it, I'm going to try to ping the switch there. 
Oh, that's what is it? Oh yeah. Okay. So it just took a while to get our ARPs going. Uh, if you don't remember what ARP is, sorry. We can ping the other switch here. And usually on the first ping, we use a ping or two. So now we got all five. Awesome. So we can ping both from the router, but they can't ping each other across. What we're missing here is we go into our configuration mode and our interface view on one. This is command called IP. I swear I had this command. Um, am, I, am I typing it wrong? No. Oh, oh. Not in the interface. A silly mistake. Um, so don't feel bad if you make a mistake like this because I make them too. Uh, IP default gateway. And then um, I will do the router's interface. So that's the interface right here on the router in the blue circle. And now I can ping 10.2.2.1, which is, well, which is the other router interface, which I didn't ping before, but I couldn't have if I wanted to. Um, but I still can't ping that other switch over here. And what this is, is this switch also needs a default gateway. Running configuration mode. 1.2.2.1. And now we will try the ping again. And wow, successful, awesome. So that default gateway tells us how to get out of our network. Um, the, only, the only kind of networking device that doesn't need a default gateway is gonna be our router device. Uh, now, when you get into the industry, you'll realize that more than just routers can do routing. So any device that does routing won't necessarily need a default gateway um, if it knows where all your networks are. But just keep that in mind. In general, if it's not a router, you probably need a uh, default gateway. PC, switch, whatever. So, um, I used this command a moment ago, show IP interface brief. Very helpful one, I use it all the time um, to make sure that my interfaces are up. See, in this case, they're down, down. Um, and to make sure my IP addresses are set and all that cool stuff. Any questions so far? Everything makes sense? Am I going too fast, too slow? Yep, um, there is a lot, and um, hopefully we'll we'll review enough to um, get you back in the groove here. Um, I know it's a struggle when life takes you kind of off the course, and you end up coming back a year or two later, and um, you kind of miss a lot of stuff and forget a lot of stuff. But um, of course, if you have any questions, if anything I say doesn't make sense, or I assume you have knowledge that you don't have, let me know. And um, I'm more than happy to, to review something with you. And we also did a, a quick review of a couple of things that I noticed students usually have trouble with um, on Tuesday. So there is a replay available if you go to the announcements tab. There is a link to that on YouTube. Uh, which is not, of course, the whole course, but just a couple of things that that usually some students have trouble with. So full duplex communication is going to increase the efficiency of the bandwidth by allowing both of our ends to send and receive at the same time. So in years past, we've had, there's one channel, it's like a one way street. Uh, we actually, I promise I didn't plan this this way. Uh, we had a road closure right by my house here and I came home for lunch and um, all of a sudden it's one lane. Like we've got this construction crew out there, they're digging up the side of the road and all of a sudden it's a one lane street instead of a two lane. So one side has to stop and wait for everyone to go and then they get to go, right? They take their turn. I'm sure most of us that drive, um, I'm assuming you guys drive, um, have seen this kind of stuff before. And you gotta wait, it takes a little longer, but it's usually pretty okay unless there's a lot of traffic, right? If it's a really congested time or area, it might be a pain in the butt, but for the most part, it's, it's okay. For what we have, you know, we, we use that. That's kind of like half duplex. And full duplex, we can go both ways at the same time, right? So we're not hindering the traffic. 
some other people use an analogy of like the left turn lane. Um, so you can't turn left and, and go straight at the same time because you hit each other. So you have to wait to turn left until there's nobody going. Same idea. Um, so since we had the gigabit standard, now we have 10 gig, 25 gig. Um, we were talking about buying some new network gear. We are talking about 25 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig interfaces, super freaking crazy fast. Um, you know, we have all those standards now. Only 100 megabit or 10 megabit, which are very old standards, are going to support half duplex. Pretty much everything today supports full duplex um, and will only support full duplex. Um, there's no benefit of going to half duplex um, unless you need like less physical cable, which is not a problem in today's world. So, oh, this slide triggers me. Uh, duplex and speed. So we talked about duplex. Speed is just how fast we can go, right? It's like a speed limit. Um, so you'll see a lot of 10, 100, 1,000 ports. So those are 10 meg, 100 meg, or 1,000 meg, or 1 gig. 1,000 meg, 1 gig, same thing. Uh, we'll see those a lot. We'll see a lot of 1 gig. We'll see a lot of 10 gig today um, in your data centers and um, your uplinks to your core. And maybe even faster, depending on, on where you're working and what your, your needs are. So we want to make sure we keep these speed and duplex settings the same on both sides of one link. So we have um, maybe a server that's connected to a switch. We want them to negotiate nine times out of 10. We want them to auto negotiate. Hey, what's the highest you can go? I can go to a gig and this other side says, okay, I can do a gig too. So we're going to negotiate at a gig. If they can't, maybe they'll negotiate a hundred meg or, or whatever. And they'll try to negotiate the highest they can. Now, for some reason you're worried about negotiation or negotiation isn't working, then you can set these duplex and speed manually. If you do that, you have to do it on both sides. Very, very important. You have to do it on both sides. If you don't, if they're mismatched, you're going to have all kinds of port errors. You're going to have input errors or output errors or um, just, just all kinds of nasty errors. And we'll talk about them in a little bit. We'll talk about those specifically. Um, but you don't want that to happen. You want to make sure 100 um, percent either it's auto negotiated and negotiating properly. There were some problems with negotiating 100 meg. Um, so a lot of people will hard code 100 meg connections. Um, but usually one gig, it's all super smooth, super easy. Now at the bottom here, they say all fiber optic ports, such as this one gig base SX port, operate at one preset speed and are always full duplex. I'm not sure I agree with that statement. Um, some ports maybe. Um, one preset speed, yes. Full duplex always. Ah, maybe that port, yes always full duplex, but there are simplex, um, transceivers, which are little, I should have got a transceiver so I can show you. They're little, um, little devices that slide into an interface. And so you could have, um, an SFP interface, which is going to accept those, those transceivers and your transceiver can have copper interfaces. It could have a fiber interface, could have different speeds of interfaces. Um, there's a lot of options there, right? So they call it a, small form factor pluggable or something like that. And um, they do have simplex where you can use one strand of fiber, not necessarily two, which is simplex, which is not full duplex, not quite half duplex either, but that's, that's a very complicated topic. So this is kind of showing where we're negotiating here. Oh, it looks like actually they're hard coding. So if you look in the, the config here on the right, they're going to go into an interface. They're gonna set the duplex to full. That's a manual config, right? We're overriding any kind of negotiation. The speed is set to 100 meg. We're overriding any kind of negotiation there. You have to do it on both sides. If you did this on one side, if you did it just on S2, but not on S1, then S1 would assume because it's 100 meg that it would be a half duplex connection. So S1 would all of a sudden have a bunch of collisions and it would be a very bad day. Auto MDIX is one of those technologies that I did not know existed, but somehow saved my life um, before I even knew it existed. Um, so Auto MDIX is an 
awesome technology. It um, only works on switches, right? It's only a switch technology. This doesn't work on routers. This doesn't work on uh, PCs. But usually a switch is going to be our intermediary device, so we don't have to worry about it. So when we um, connect two devices together, excuse me, it's not important. Okay, when we connect two devices together, uh, this might be better for the whiteboard. Can I? Oh, let me try to enable my camera. Give me one second. Ah, it's not popping up. Give me one second. Let's see if I can get this to work. Dang, it's been working the whole time and now it doesn't want to work. Um, oh, did my did my camera freeze? My camera froze. That's awesome. Oh, let me try redoing the camera here. Ah, now it's my other camera. That's what happened. That's my whiteboard camera. But can I make it... Can I stop sharing my screen and stop sharing? Can you can you see my webcam? Is it large? Is it big enough? It's, not, it's probably not gonna work. I'll give up now. I won't draw. We'll save this for another day. Uh, share. Okay. Um, now I lost my chat window here. Chat. Um, I don't know if you can see. Yeah, see, I couldn't see the chat. Um, let me see if I have this annotation thing here. I should be able to. Notate. So I want I want a plain background, but so if we have um, a switch here and another switch, and um, we're going to use port uh, not ports three and six. Those are the pins we use in the Ethernet cable to transmit and receive. Right, one, two, three, and six. Now the problem is you connect these together and switches by default use the same pins to send and the same pins to receive. So this switch says, um, I don't know exactly which ones it is per switch, but let's just say one and two, uh, whoop, oh, one and two here, I'm gonna use to send. This guy says, I'm also gonna use one and two to send. Well, if we both use one and two to send, we're gonna have a collision, right? These are gonna explode and it's not gonna work. So what we need to do is we need to have this switch over here say, I'm going to use three and six, not one and two, to transmit, but I'm going to use one and two to receive. One and two to receive, and then, oh, oh, I can move this, okay. We're going to use three and six down here to tra uh, receive on this side. So we're going to basically flip-flop, um, let me unplug this so you can see me. Oh, now it's not what X is mad. Okay. Uh, can I hit video again? 
There you go. Okay. Sweet. Back to annotating. Um, so we're going to flip flop on either side. Um, now one switch is using one and two to transmit. The other switch is using three and six to transmit. So if we have um, a switch and a PC, right? By deep, uh, obviously I can't draw. Let's say the PC here. So this PC here is going to, by default, it usually plugs into switches, right? So it usually plugs into switches. Um, so it's gonna, by default, maybe transmit over three and six, and this will transmit over one and two and receive on three and six. That would work just great. But when we start connecting one switch to another switch, we need that, that flip-flopping. We don't need to use that flip-flopping when we're connecting a switch to a router or a switch to a PC. Um, the, the other way we do this is if we connect, um, is there an eraser? Let me see. Can you see that? Okay. Um, so if we have, let's say a router and a router, and we connect, whoop, we connect these routers together, then we're gonna have to use a crossover cable. And what the crossover cable is, is it actually has in the wires, it works like this. So maybe this is one and two, and this is three and six, and then three and six, and one and two. And it basically does the same thing. Just auto MDIX is done, um, I don't wanna say in software, but it's done without a physical cable difference. So it doesn't matter if I use a crossover cable or a straight through cable on my ethernet switches. Uh, whereas if I'm doing router to router, um, or PC to PC directly, we're going to need this crossover cable. Does that make sense? Um, please let me know if that doesn't make sense because this is kind of a, an odd topic. Makes sense to me. Um, and I definitely don't want to. Okay. If y'all are good, then I will move on. Um, again, if there's any more questions, anyone's welcome to email me with questions. Um, and I'll try to answer them the best I can. Um, if you can't understand my email, say, hey, can we Skype or WebEx or something? <laughs> so I know sometimes explaining stuff's hard um, over email. So anyway, if you're not familiar with the show run um, command, you should be. Um, it'll show your entire running config. It'll show you everything you've configured on the switch or router um, or other device if it supports this command, like an ASA firewall. Um, in this case, we're going to see, hey, I'm, I'm going to play this annotate thing again. We have the interface 99 here, and we put an IP address on it and an IP6 address. So we can verify our switch config. So if we want to show interfaces, fast Ethernet 018, we can see here, um, we can see, well, we have a keep alive set. We have full duplex, 100 megabit, um, the media type. So the switch itself can be either 10 or 100. We, we had 100. Um, I don't think it says if it's negotiated or not. Um, well, we can see our MAC address here, right? BIA stands for burned in address. Uh, we can see um, our bandwidth, which is directly relatable to our speed, um, the liability. Um, and you'll, you'll hear more about these um, when we're talking about routing protocols and stuff like that. So what kind of encapsulation are we using and stuff like that. So network access layer issues. Um, if you don't remember what an access layer is, we have our three tier network design, right? So I'm gonna use the crap out of this annotate thing. I'm just gonna change this blue. So we'll have our core, our distribution, in our access layer here. So, so here at the core, we're gonna have some core functions done, a lot of really cool, um, and you'll see this kind of diagram a lot, right? Looks more like purple than blue, but whatever. Um, you'll see something like this a lot. Oh, nope, 
wrong way, but whatever, we'll leave it there. But you'll see, ah, I'm not even good at this. Um, so you'll see here at the access layer, we actually have our devices, right? We have our desktops, maybe we have um, a little wireless access point, um, whatever else we have, our devices are actually gonna connect to this access layer here. I'm not gonna try to do that anymore. Anyway, so we have all of our devices connected to our access layer. Now up in the core and the distribution layers, we're dealing with a lot of really cool technologies. We're dealing with a lot of uh, more complicated stuff, but for the most part, an entry level network admin, or when you're starting as a network engineer, you're gonna deal a lot with the access layer. You're gonna do a lot with the really kind of the, the smaller things. Um, usually a uh, newer person you wanna put um, relatively in a position where they're not going to like destroy the entire network, right? Say you had, you know, a hundred more of these access layer switches that all connected back and all that cool stuff. But um, at your core layer, you only really had like two, which is pretty normal, right? These are really, really expensive switches here at the core layer. The access ones are cheaper. So at the core layer, uh, these are gonna be really, really expensive. And if you take these down, all of a sudden the entire network is down. So for the guys that are new, not because we're picking on them, but because we know that you know, everybody makes mistakes and when you're newer, you tend to have a tendency to make more mistakes. Um, unless you're me, which I always make mistakes. Um, they wanna put you down on, hey, if you screw up this access layer switch, maybe you'll take down you know, uh, 30 or 40 users, but you won't take down you know, 30,000 or however many the whole network relies on. Or how many rely on the whole network. So at the network access layer, we can do stuff like see, hey, like what's up with our ports um, and stuff like that. Interface is up, line protocol is down, right? So has anyone seen that where it's up and then down? So it says instead of up, up, it says up, down. Um, that's a layer two protocol issue. So the first up there, in, and you'll see here, let me say again, haha. So if you see here, the first up, this is our layer one, and this up is layer two. So um, here at layer one, we're talking about like a physical cable, right? A physical layer. Um, layer two, we're gonna talk about our data link layer Do DL, move that out of the way. Um, our data link layers, so we're going to deal with stuff like MAC addresses. Can't, I can't do A's. MAC addresses. And we're going to deal with stuff like, uh, I don't think we've learned about HDLC yet. And stuff like that. So if we have a problem here, if this is down here, um, then we can check these protocols as opposed to the physical cable here. We know as a network admin pretty quickly. Um, which one of these is causing the problem. So we can use our show interfaces. Um, and this is a great one here. I'm not gonna go through all of this. There's a lot of data here. We can see if these things, these runs and these giants, we mentioned those uh, runs are, are frames that are too small. Giants are uh, frames that are too big and we can enable jumbo frames on some data center type um, gear. That's gonna allow us to actually use those giant frames. Uh, you'll see there's, there's a couple of input errors here. This is probably in a lab environment. So um, that's probably unusual. Well, actually we had quite a few packets here. Um, eight output errors, that's not huge. Um, but if you look here, actually there's 1700 collisions. That's a lot. And 235 late collisions. That's a lot. These are, these are things we want to be zero, right? Zero, 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 zero. Um, a couple of CRCs. We notice there's a lot of collisions here. So that makes me think there's probably a duplex issue between the two interfaces, whatever interface is connecting to 018 here, uh, because that will create collisions. So we'll go into detail about a couple of these. You can kind of review this on your own. If you have any questions, again, email me. Um, but there's some details on what all these different errors mean. Input and output errors. 
uh, runt frames, giants, CRC errors. These are all different kind of errors and they mean different things. Um, and I don't want to get too deep into them because it's just kind of briefly. Um, collisions, light collisions, usually that has to do with duplex mismatches, right? We're half duplex on one side with a full duplex on the other side. A late collision um, is very interesting. It's actually when a part of the frame has gotten to um, to the other device, right? So it's sent from one device, it's actually gotten to the other device. And we've already had 512 bits um, actually get there. But all of a sudden there's a collision after the frame was being received. This is probably a hardware issue with the switch port or computer port um, or something like that. Um, but this is not super, not super common to see late collisions. Um, here's a little flow chart, right? Is the interface up? If it's not, verify your cabling. Um, if it is, is there EMI or noise? Is there other problems that could potentially um, cause issues? So we have some nice Wireshark pictures here. Telnet, if you're not familiar enough with Telnet, um, again, uses port 23. So SSH uses port 22. Telnet uses port 23. Easy to get confused. Telnet is the older protocol, but uses a higher port number. That's how I remember it. Um, so it sends everything in plain text, which actually means you hit a button on your keyboard and it actually sends that button across the wire in clear text. So, whoa, I, I pressed a button on my keyboard and did this thing. I, this is cool. Uh, I didn't know that was a keyboard shortcut. But, um, <clears throat> So you can see here in this packet capture, we're seeing this user access verification, which is a prompt from our switch, which is asking for our username. Now this isn't quite as pretty as you might hope, but you can see A D M I M admin. So that looks like they're typing in admin and the password is CCNA. So you can see here that the username is admin, the password is CCNA. And you can see that in the packet capture. So if anyone is doing this man in the middle type attack, right, for some reason they they got access to something, they're doing some network sniffing, and they see this packet, for some reason they get their hands on that, then now they can see our username and password in clear text, log into our switch, and do whatever they want, which is very, very bad. SSH is what we want to use. It's the more um, modern protocol. So we're going to use port 22 uh, TCP, and it's secure. Everything's encrypted. We're going to use, um, we're going to use our certificates to encrypt everything. So you'll see in this packet capture, there's a bunch of gobble cubes talking about uh, this SHA-256. You know, this is some stuff about the um, about the certificate in here, but this is not readable text. You can't just go, oh yeah, hey, there's the, there's the username and password that I'm looking for. Um, so it's a lot harder for an attacker to get a hold of credentials or something if he's already um, sniffing in your network or maybe Maybe you're telnetting across the internet. Um, some organizations SSH over the internet. So you definitely wouldn't want telnet in that situation. So to enable SSH on a switch, we have to have a special version of iOS that um, enables encryption because some places, some countries, encryption is illegal. Uh, fortunately for us, we are in the US and we have access to encryption so we can be safe. Um, it's kind of like the government saying you can't lock your front door. Um, I'm kind of against that, but that's a, that's a kind of, I guess, more of a political opinion than anything. I probably shouldn't talk too much about that. Um, anyway, so we have the ability to do encryption here in the U S and so you'll see here, and I'll pull up the annotation again. You'll see here in the, uh, software we're using, it has this little K nine right there. And that means we can use encryption. Um, and that's, I mean, that's really the only difference between a switch that ships here and a, a switch that ships in um, an area that doesn't allow encryption. And encryption is illegal and Cisco is going to say, hey, we'll, we'll not allow encryption on those devices. So keep that in mind. And you can do that just the show version command. We'll show you that. So to configure SSH, um, this is quite verbose here. A couple things. Uh, we're going to verify support. I usually don't do that. I usually try to enable it. And if I can't enable it, I go, oh, it doesn't support it. 
Um, <laughs> we're going to configure an IP domain name, generate our RSA key pairs, um, which is going to be hash search certificate. That's going to enable our encryption. Um, we're going to configure user authentication. So we're going to have a username and password. We're going to configure the VTY lines to prompt for that username and password and enables SSH version two. Uh, we can do this. It's not required. You can use version one if you want. I usually want to use version two though. Um, this is important. We want to use the um, login local command right here. And we also can have uh, another command that will only allow us to use SSH or only allow us to use Telnet or allow us to use both, depending on what we want to do. And then we can verify. Um, so we can go to a terminal emulation program like PuTTY, um, or if you're on Linux, you can natively SSH. And you can log in, it'll prompt you for a username here, and then a password. And if you have an enabled password, when you enable it, it'll prompt you for that as well. Ooh, excuse me. So we can also, in the command line, show IP SSH, SSH is enabled, what version we have, um, and we can see, hey, are there connections currently established here? These are currently established connections. We can see admin is connected twice. And this is why we have, you know, terminal lines zero through 15, right? It gives us 16 total lines. Um, and so we can have multiple people log in at the same time. Um, it looks like it actually came out, but we have that option to have multiple people log in at the same time. Basic router configuration. Now uh, I'm gonna go kind of fast through this because you should remember a lot of this. Um, these kind of commands should be very familiar to you, right? Config T, set a host name, enable your secret, um, your line console right here your VTY, so they're only doing zero through four. Usually you want to do zero through 15. Um, it's more of a preference thing. This is important in the real production environment, uh, but in a lab environment, zero through four will work fine. And if you use any kind of passwords and not secrets, like we here we enabled secret that's encrypted, but this password is not encrypted, right? So we want to actually do that service password encryption for um, so that we encrypt our passwords. We can't have someone is sitting behind us to see our password. Of course, we have banners and um, copy run start, very, very important. Dual stack technology um, allows us to run IPv4 and IPv6 on the same network. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. You have to make sure that, of course, whatever you're doing supports IPv4 and or IPv6. Uh, hopefully it does. But you can run both technologies at the same time. This allows um, companies to transition a little easier from IPv4 to IPv6. So on our router interfaces, uh, by default, router interfaces are off, and by default, switch interfaces are on. So we want to make sure we remember this no shutdown anytime we're configuring a router, every single interface, with the exception of loopbacks, which I don't think we've talked about yet. They're virtual pretend interfaces, basically. Um, but any real interface, we're going to do the no shutdown command on a router. Um, description is optional, but we need at least one IP address, um, whether that's IPv6 or IPv4. So here's some basic configs. I'm not going to run over all of that. Um, again, the slides are in Netacad under files. Oh, it's been an hour. Okay, let's speed up. So, loopback interfaces. Oh, we keep, I totally forgot we talked about this. So they're just virtual interfaces. They live, they're kind of like a switch virtual interface. Um, they kind of live inside of the router. And we can do this for, for things like ping tests, if we want to do ping tests on loopback interfaces, but we don't want to allow ping on our router interfaces. Um, sometimes this is used for management as well. So maybe we want to um, actually SSH into a loopback address and we want to block SSH to the actual routers routing address so we can use this for management purposes and other things like that so we're gonna go through a bunch of show commands really quickly here um, sharpie interface brief one of my favorites 
show running config interface, and then we can have our interface ID, so like G00 or something like that. G. Um, show IP route is going to be very important when we start talking about routing. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that towards the end of this class, and then in the third class, we'll talk a lot about routing. Um, or if we're talking about IPv6 routing, we can see that there. And we'll have a couple of different codes, C, L, um, S for static. is another one, um, but you'll get the codes when you run the show command at the very beginning of Zap. So uh, these are some demonstration of those commands. Again, you can review this on your own if you need to. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask now or ask via email. Same thing. So again, demonstrating the command here, what that looks like. Show IPv4 or IPv6 route. And it's kind of explaining some of the, you'll see here, they show you the codes, right? Here's connected, there's local, there's static, users, per user static route. Uh, don't worry about that. So um, one thing you'll notice here is connected, uh, connected and local here actually look like the same network. Um, what you'll notice is that this is a slash 32, the second one, a local. Um, what that means is all our bits are on in our subnet mask. So this is actually just this one IP address, just dot one of that network range. And that's because this is actually the address assigned to the interface here. And if we go back, I think you can see that uh, G000 is 192.168.10.1, 192.168.10.1 right there, G000 at the top. So you'll see that actually is the interface uh, IP address assigned there. My very favorite, filtering show commands. So if you're familiar with Linux, this will be um, familiar to you. If you're not, probably not. We have this wonderful, um, let me turn on annotating here. It's a wonderful pipe character, right? So if you don't know where that is, you have your enter key, right? Or your return key, whatever you want to call it. Oh, I can't do that. Um, and then right above it is this key right here. It's got like a slash and a, a pipe. We call this a pipe. Um, and if, so if you hold your shift key and you press the key right above enter, usually um, you'll get that pipe. And so you can do like a show run and then you can pipe and now you have these options here. So we can, I want a particular section of my show run. I want a particular, I want to include certain lines. I want to exclude certain lines. Or I want to begin at a certain line. So uh, one of the ones I, I would do is like I include IP, and then, which I can actually go and do my router here. Woo, I need to turn the annotating off, okay. Um, I go to my router, and I show run pipe include IP. I'll see, hey, I have um, IP staff turned on, which we, I don't think we'll talk about that in this course. Um, but we have these IP addresses assigned. Now, I don't know which interfaces they are by this output, but I know they're assigned here. Um, and I know we have flow export on here. Yeah. Uh, but you can do different things like include interface. We can say, hey, these are all our interfaces. Um, I could do, I don't think Packet Tracer supports, oh, it does support section. VLAN. So I can actually see my VLAN config here. Um, which on the router would be nothing. But if I go to the switch, show run pipe section VLAN, have to capitalize that V, and you'll see here that uh, we'll actually see the VLAN configurations here, which is super helpful if you wanna see just part of your show run and not the entire running config. Another thing is we have command history. So um, I did talk about this before, but if you ever hit the up arrow, you can see previously done commands. 
and you can rerun them pretty easily. Um, same thing with Control P will also go up and Control N will also go down, but usually up and down arrow keys um, are the easiest. If you can do this show history command, excuse me, and you can see what commands you ran recently as well that way. Um, and you can change this. So if you do terminal history size, can I not? And you can see I can have up to 256 commands saved in that history. And that's all we have. Any questions? All good here. I hope all y'all are healthy and um, hearty. Good, good. Um, so just kind of a, a quick update before we close here. Um, there's kind of some conflicting information. Um, on one hand, we may start the class online next week. Um, on the other, we will wait um, until the campuses are opening, I think on the 13th. So um, I'm not 100% sure what we're gonna do right now because they specifically didn't address this, this class structure. Um, they addressed classes that already started. They addressed online classes, what they were gonna do. Um, and some other stuff but then they asked me like are you ready to teach online like next week and i'm like well yeah but i thought i wasn't teaching and so it's it's kind of back and forth and i'll let y'all guys know as soon as i know um, if we're not going to be meeting um, i'm going to plan on doing these kind of things um, probably once a week so that we at least have some done before excuse me for a second So that we have a couple of these chapters done before we actually get in the semester because either way it's going to go we're going to miss a week or two um, so i want to make sure that we can get through all the material and you guys aren't stiffed for some of that so again if you have any questions anything um, nothing is actually due until we actually start the semester so um, just be aware that you don't have to take any tests you won't have to do any labs or anything like that um, it is great to start early. Um, I can't have you take tests early, but if you want to start on a packet tracer and stuff like that on your own, on your own time, again, I'm not requiring it. Um, it is not going to be due until a reasonable time after the semester starts. So just keep that in mind. Um, I have to give everybody a fair chance. If for some reason they can't be here, I don't want to, um, I don't want to hinder their education either. Right. Um, so we want to make sure that we're giving everybody an opportunity to do well and, and learn a lot in this class. So I was supposed to get an email today. It was officially going to say what I was going to do, but then I never got one. So it is what it is. And um, for those of you who are here, does it matter if this would be on a Tuesday night or a Thursday night? Do you all have a preference? I'm leaning towards Tuesday nights, um, but that's me personally. Um, so probably we'll have some kind of announcement in Medicaid that says, hey, you know, we're planning on doing a lecture on Tuesday online. Um, but definitely, hopefully by Friday, I'll have like a concrete, like this is what we're doing. This is how we're gonna proceed. Um, Either way, we're not going to meet in person for at least, um, I think, a month. I think it's a month. Um, it's like mid-April. Yeah, like April 16th or something like that. So um, either way, we won't meet in person. So we'll probably do at least a lecture on Tuesday next, next week if you all are available. Um, and go over Chapter 2 and any kind of updates or anything else. Any questions before we close?
And were you all able to, um, did everything make sense? Did, were you able to get into the YouTube replays and stuff like that? Um, yes, everything's available on Medicat. Okay, cool. Um, sweet. So I will be updating. So I tried to upload them. It didn't work so well. They decided I, they limit my, my usage here. But if you go to videos, I'm going to update this this here with new links as I upload them. So, um, and I'll probably also post them as well in our announcements here. So just look for those. And um, yeah, are, are those useful? I think they email them to you. Do you see those? Or is there a better way to do this? I'm totally open for suggestions. Um, I want to make sure that whatever I'm doing is actually useful to you and not not wasting everybody's time. So that works well. Yeah, it's it's what we have right now. <laughs> so um, obviously we can't meet in person, so. Um, this is what we'll be doing, at least for the time being. Um, but yeah, if you all have any questions, have a good night. Um, hazmat suits, yeah. Um, there's a shortage of those, so just be careful. Um, yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing what we have shortages of when stuff happens, like toilet paper. So, well, there's no other questions. Have a good night. Um, Enjoy your weekend. Yes, sir. That's what I'm here for. And uh, hopefully I'll see you guys Tuesday.